Hello everyone, welcome to the Life in the Universe pandemic series. This is just a short set of talks about topics that I think are interesting uh, about life in the universe. For those of you that are uh, isolated at home, uh, here we're in day two, I think it is, of the national lockdown, and I'm pretty sure it's a Thursday. Quite difficult to tell these days. Anyway, today's topic that I thought would be interesting to, uh, to talk about is this one. Is there life on rogue planets? Now, these are very intriguing and interesting objects uh, in the universe. They're sometimes called uh, orphan planets or wanderers. And my favorite description of these worlds is Steppenwolf planets. Uh, Steppenwolf being German for uh, a wolf that lives in the, uh, in the steppe. And also a title uh, by a novel by Hermann Hesse called Der Steppenwolf. Uh, in fact, that's what inspired uh, someone to name these planets. Steppenwolf planets. And these, these rogue planets are planets drifting through uh, the interstellar void, unconnected with any particular star. Uh, and the reason why I find Steppenwolf planets rather poetic is because you can imagine these planets drifting through space uh, like a wolf wandering across the galactic steppe or through the interstellar uh, Siberia, if you like. So Steppenwolf planets uh, sound like they're science fiction, right? They're the sort of thing you might see in some sort of science fiction film, a sort of dark, uh, almost um, invisible planet wandering across uh, interstellar space. You can imagine the Star Trek crew coming across such a thing. But they're not science fiction at all. Uh, you can observe them and we know that they're real. And you might think, how can you observe um, a Steppenwolf planet? Because like most, uh, well, most extrasolar planets are in orbit around a conventional star. And if you look edge on and that planet moves in front of the star, it blocks out some of the sunlight and you can detect that planet. Uh, that is one of the ways in which people detect uh, extrasolar planets. Another way you can detect uh, extrasolar planets is when the planet is in orbit around a star, then it causes the star to wobble slightly as they orbit around their common center of mass. So being in orbit around a star is very useful for detection because it opens up all sorts of ways of finding planets around other stars. But what happens if you're a Steppenwolf planet and you're drifting through the interstellar void unconnected with any star, uh, very dark, not necessarily giving off any light, uh, very, very difficult to detect. But there are ways that we can do this. Uh, one of the things that you will recall, uh, which was predicted by Einstein, is that if you have a massive enough object, it will bend light. So as light passes by a, a black hole, for example, uh, it will be bent by that object a little bit like a lens bends light. And a Steppenwolf planet is not as massive as a black hole, but it is sufficiently massive to bend light ever so slightly. And when a Steppenwolf planet uh, passes in front of a star in the background, of course, remember, it's not in orbit around a star itself, but when it passes in front of a star that happens to be in the background, it will cause that starlight to bend slightly. And if you are observing that star from the Earth as that planet uh, comes between you and the star, it will cause a micro lensing event, as it's called. Essentially, the light is lensed around the planet, distorted slightly, and that tells you that there is a Steppenwolf planet passing uh, in front of that star at some distance away from it. And this is the way in which these Steppenwolf planets have been detected. And it turns out that there are a remarkable number of them. Uh, some people estimated there could be billions of them. A more recent uh, survey suggested that there is one of these planets for every four uh, main sequence stars, a main sequence star being a star like our own sun uh, that is burning hydrogen and a variety of other types of stars as well. So one per four stars, main sequence stars, is actually a vast number of these planets. There may be uh, hundreds of millions, billions of them in our own uh, Milky Way galaxy. So they're certainly not rare. You might think, how do these planets um, form? Because as we all know from basic astronomy, planets form when a giant protoplanetary disk forms around a star in the early history of the solar system. A planet condenses out of that material and ends up in orbit around a star. Well, when that process is occurring, uh, there's lots of dynamical interactions between the planets in that early planetary system. And sometimes those interactions can be so um, disturbing that they will actually throw a planet out of that solar system into the void, essentially ejected into uh, interstellar space, uh, which is why sometimes they're called orphan planets. 
because they once had a mother star and then they were thrown out into interstellar space and now they are on their own drifting through space. Uh, so these orphan planets are the result of dynamical interactions. Uh, another way this, this can happen is that if you have a binary star system, that's two stars um, orbiting each other, uh, sometimes those interactions between a star can set up gravitational disturbances in a solar system and hurl a planet out of that star system to become an orphan or a steppenwolf planet. So these are essentially um, uh, rejects, if you like, not so much rejects, but planets that have happened to have been uh, hurtled out of a, an early solar system. So the interesting thing to think about is could these planets have life? They don't seem to be very good places for life. Uh, they're no longer around a star, so they're not going to be warmed up by solar radiation, allowing an ocean on their surface like we associate with the Earth. So surely they would just be frozen lumps of rock, maybe with some gases in their atmospheres, but nothing much more. Uh, surely a biologist would have no interest in a steppenwolf planet. But in fact, this isn't necessarily the case. Um, some of these planets may have hydrogen atmospheres. Many planets, when they first form in a solar system, have a hydrogen atmosphere, and that atmosphere is essentially dissipated away by the intense ultraviolet radiation and also the solar wind from the star in that solar system. If the planet is ejected from the solar system, then there's nothing to blow that hydrogen atmosphere away. And so it retains an ancient atmosphere of hydrogen. And it turns out that hydrogen is very good at trapping heat. And it may well be that some of these stars, as they drift through space, are sufficiently warmed on their surfaces to maintain pockets of liquid water under thick hydrogen atmospheres. There are other ways that these planets could be warmed as well. Deep in our own planet, uh, there are radioactive elements like uranium and thorium and potassium. And these radioactive elements break down over time, uh, heating up the inside of our planet. It's one of the mechanisms by which heat is generated inside the Earth, as well as the primordial heat when we first formed out of that protoplanetary disk. So these Steppenwolf planets drifting through space will have some primordial heat from when they were first formed in the solar system uh, from which they came. And they will also have these radioactive elements breaking down inside the rocks, heating them from the inside. So one could imagine that buried deep inside these planets, there could be environments that are suitable for life, even though these planets are no longer uh, captured by a star. So these are very fascinating planets to think about because we can model them and think about the conditions on their surface and in the interior and work out whether there could be pockets of conditions for life. Another way we could imagine a Steppenwolf planet uh, having conditions suitable for life is if it was covered by ice and that ice would act as an insulator and that same radioactive heat that I just mentioned would permeate uh, through the planet warming liquid water that would be trapped beneath this thick uh, icy crust layer on the surface of the planet. So these are all speculations based on models. We've never observed these things, uh, but they're tantalizing because they suggest that maybe out there uh, is the amazing possibility of uh, drifting isolated planets with conditions suitable for life. Could we ever explore a Steppenwolf planet? Well, that would be a very difficult thing to do. Uh, we don't know of any such planet that's very close by where we could send a mission in any reasonable length of time. Some of these planets may be hundreds or thousands of light years away, um, but you could speculatively imagine uh, a Steppenwolf uh, planetary mission. Uh, for example, what you could do is launch a spacecraft towards such a target, which would be very difficult to find in the first place, but you could maybe detect such a world in a microlensing event, you could track it, and then you could send a spacecraft that might get there a few thousand years later, and it would fly past. Of course, to get to that planet in a reasonable length of time, you would have to be going quite fast, which would mean it'd be very difficult to break your spacecraft and put it into orbit around your Steppenwolf planet. Uh, you don't have the luxury of a giant star around which it's orbiting, which you could use to do some sort of slingshot. So probably the best way is to fly past. You could imagine a Steppenwolf planet uh, flyby mission and you hurtle past the planet, taking images as you go along. Maybe as the spacecraft approaches this planet, it releases a couple of penetrators that hurtle in through the atmosphere of the planet, taking measurements as they go and slamming into the surface of the Steppenwolf planet, getting fantastical images of the surface of one of these uh, lone rogue worlds 
just before they hit the surface where perhaps they take measurements of heat, geothermal heat coming up from the planet to allow earthbound observers to see whether this planet is um, suitable for life. Maybe it even has a life detection instrument on it. And then a few thousand years later, a lucky PhD student sitting in front of their laptop in some lab receives this information back from this mission uh, many thousands of light years away, and they write their PhD thesis on this fantastical data that's come back from this mission that was launched thousands of years before. Um, could we ever land on such a Steppenwolf planet? Um, I'm not an orbital dynamicist, but I think uh, I expect that it would be an extremely difficult thing to do to slow down a spacecraft uh, hurtling past one of these planets to land on the surface. The other thing we could do is observe these planets using giant telescopes from the Earth without actually visiting them. If they do have hydrogen uh, atmospheres, maybe we could use spectroscopy to look at the uh, content of those atmospheres and see whether they're suitable for life. Of course, as these planets are not in orbit around a star, they're very dark, so it may be very difficult to pick up a signal of what is in the atmospheres of these planets. So these are perhaps some of the most challenging uh, astrobiological targets in the universe, studying the atmospheric composition, the surface characteristics, and the possibilities for life on a Steppenwolf uh, planet. Uh, perhaps one of the most difficult uh, projects that you could give to an, uh, an astrobiologist. But despite these difficulties, they are a very intriguing class of objects in the universe. And the idea that a, a planet, a completely lone planet, could be suitable for life uh, pushes the boundaries of our understandings of the limits of life and the possibilities of life in the universe. So even if we never get to visit one of these planets or take measurements directly, we can at least use them as a thought experiment to consider uh, where are the most extreme environments in the universe where we could expect to find conditions for life or even life itself. So that's today's topic. Thank you very much uh, for watching this lecture series. Uh, keep well. Bye.